Good afternoon, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is Scottish Parliament corporate body uh, questions. Uh, I'd invite members wishing to ask a supplementary question to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. There's quite a number on the order paper. I'm keen to get through as many as I can. So brief questions and answers where possible. In terms of supplementaries, just to advise colleagues in relation to question four and five, I'd like to take supplementaries after question five has been answered. Call question number one, Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I refer members to my register of interest as a member of GMB Trade Union to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body when it will next meet with representatives from the GMB Trade Union MSP staff branch. Jackson Carlow. Uh, well, Mr Bibby is a faithful attender of these corporate body sessions. Will I'm sure recall the substance of the answer I gave to Pam Duncan Glancy when she asked this question in November last year. But to summarise, there is no employment relationship between the corporate body and the MSP staff. And it would not, therefore, we believe, be appropriate for the corporate body to meet with the GMB in its capacity as the representative of staff employed by MSPs. The corporate body's role is to apply appropriate indices to ensure that provisions relating to staff costs contained within the members' expenses scheme are operated annually. Thereafter, it is a matter for individual employers, MSPs as individual employers, to determine the salaries for their staff. Neil Bibby. I thank Mr Carlo for that answer and I recognise what he said about the formal uh, arrangements. Uh, but I do believe it is important for the corporate body to fully consider the views of GMB, who represent many Labour MSP staff and many other MSP staff too, ahead of staff cost provision setting process for 2024-25 and on other issues. The GMB have warmly welcomed the Chief Executive of the Parliament, indicating his willingness to be informed by these views, and I very much share this. So does the Minister agree that that is a welcome development and it is important for the corporate body to hear from the GMB on staff pay and other significant issues? Uh, affecting their members before they are made. Jackson yes. Well, while ministerial appointments do follow this uh, corporate body session, I'm, I'm not living in hope, Mr. Bibby, but thank you for the, thank you for the attribution. Uh, as, uh, um, but on behalf of the corporate body, um, can I say that, of course, it is open, it is open to MSP's staff to speak with the uh, representative on the corporate body from any given party in order to allow our consideration and deliberations to be informed. But uh, Mr Bibby also makes reference, and I think while it wouldn't be appropriate for the corporate body to meet with trade unions representing MSP staff, he is correct in that I understand the clerk, the chief executive, has indicated his willingness to do so in advance of the corporate body submitting its budget to the, public, uh, to the Finance and Public Administration Committee. And while he has indicated his willingness to do so in order to be informed of the views of the representatives of MSP staff, the corporate body is clear that that is not the equivalent of entering into a formal negotiation. Question number two, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what discussion it has had in relation to access to translation services for cross-party groups. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Member, for his question. The Scottish Parliament's corporate body is committed to providing accessibility support to enable members of the public to engage in parliamentary business. However, as the Member is aware, cross-party groups are not a formal part of parliamentary business, and as such, the corporate body is not responsible for providing resources for them. Nevertheless, as set out in the Member's Code of Conduct, cross-party groups may use the Parliament's facilities where these are available for public use. This means MSPs and CPGs can access the interpretation infrastructure of our meeting rooms, which includes a portable set of equipment and headphones. Access the advice and guidance on language support that is set out in the cross-party, cross-parliamentary group page of the Parliament's intranet. Additionally, we are aware of a facility within Microsoft Teams to support, micro, to, support to, big pardon, to support remote interpretation for informal meetings. We are developing guidance for MSPs and committees on this, and we will also place the guidance on the CPG pages of the intranet. Paul Sweeney. I thank the corporate body for that helpful response. As the convener for the cross-party group on migration, I recently asked if our CPG could access translation services as the group has a number of non-English speaking members. And I was told that the group would not have uh, to cover the cost of a translator, but as a CPG with a number of members uh, who are seeking asylum and without the right to work, we do not charge membership fees or have cash to cover translation costs. 
So, Deputy President Officer, I appreciate that the standing orders state that the CPGs are not formal parliamentary business, but will the corporate body commit to reviewing their policy on access to specifically translation services for all meetings in the Parliament, whether formal parliamentary business or not, so that we can ensure that this Parliament is accessible to all? Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the member for the supplementary. I think we're prepared to review it, but with regard to perhaps uh, course party groups having greater access to support, that would be a matter, I think, to be put to the Parliament through the Standards Procedures Group to assist them in their engagement in public, the public that they bring in. And I think that's worth looking into. Question number three, Carol Mochen. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body whether it will provide an update on pay negotiations with trade unions representing Scottish Parliament staff. Jackson Carlo. I'm pleased to be able to confirm that agreement has been reached on a pay deal for the Scottish parliamentary staff from 23-24. This deal, which was recommended for acceptance to its members by all three of the corporate bodies recognised trade unions, PCS, Prospect and FDA, was arrived at following intensive negotiations. And I'd like to place the corporate body's thanks on record to Lorna Foreman, who was leading yeah. these negotiations for the Parliament for the first time, and indeed to everybody who participated in the successful outcome of the discussions. The pay award that has been agreed is progressive and fair, ensuring that the highest percentage increases are going to those staff on the lowest grades. The corporate body has also agreed to extend its existing guarantee of no compulsory redundancies until the end of the current parliamentary session. The corporate body's wage bill for 23-24 will increase by 5.6%. And as the member will be aware, the staff cost provision, which has been accessed by members to employ their staff, has also been uplifted by 5.6% for 23-24. Therefore, it is for members to determine the salaries for their staff. The corporate body is pleased to be able to support its staff in this way and is grateful to its partner unions, actually for the pace and intensity with which they have engaged in this negotiation and come to an early resolution. Carol Mochen. Thank you. I thank the member for that answer and I welcome the pay offer that has been made, particularly the £15 an hour minimum wage that the PCS union and others has campaigned so hard and won. The Scottish Parliament is setting a really good example to others, other employers in providing a £15 an hour minimum wage. But the reality is that not all staff who work in the parliamentary estate will receive the £15 an hour. As the member will be aware, MSP staff paid in the administration and office management job family can have a minimum salary, annual salary of £20,855, equating to £11.46 an hour, case worker equating to £14.03 an hour, and the communications job family at £26,717, equating to £14.68 an hour. Given the £15 an hour minimum wage for Scottish Parliament staff, will the corporate body now consider amending the job families for MSP staff and uplifting the staff cost provision to ensure that MSP staff receive a minimum wage of £15 an hour? I did make a request um, earlier for brief questions and brief responses. Yeah, I, th I, can, I thank Jackson Carol Morgan for that. I mean, I think it is important to say that the um, pay bans which are established by the Parliament are indicative. They are not... Uh, compulsory, and it is very much a matter for individual MSPs to determine what level of pay they would wish to award. The 5.6% which is being paid to the parliamentary staff in total, as the 5.6% that is going to the staff cost provision for MSPs, means that there are members of the parliamentary staff at higher grades who will be receiving no or very little increase this year, and others at the uh, lower end who will be receiving increases in excess of 8%. So that the whole system is designed to allow a degree of uh, variation to reflect the individual circumstances of the employee, but it is for the members to decide how they deploy the sum that they have as their total staff cost provision. Question four, Maurice Gold. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it will provide an update on what preparations is made for the launch of the deposit return scheme. Claire Baker. Thank you. The SSPB is continuing to review the requirements under the Deposit and Return Scheme for Scotland Regulations 2020 and how they apply to the restaurants, coffee bars and shop on the holidays site. As part of these preparations, the Scottish Parliament has registered as a producer with Circularity Scotland as we sell Scottish Parliament branded whisky in the shop. Maurice Golden. Uh, at the moment, this Parliament's waste is collected by a Scottish-based SME that follows the highest environmental standards in waste management. However, when deposit return eventually launches, 
the contract to collect empty containers will be handled by a large multinational company that has been fined for illegally dumping waste abroad. Can the member, uh, so my question, has the minister in charge of the scheme raised any concerns about this with the corporate body and what will happen to the existing contract with the SME provider? Claire Baker. Um, Thank you. Uh, as the member will recognise, it is not appropriate for me to comment on the debate that is ongoing around the scheme. Um, we, you know, our decisions, the contract we have, uh, is, the contract that is made is with Circulate Scotland. It is not made with the Scottish Parliament, and so it is not for me to answer questions on this particular area. area. The Scottish Parliament is striving to comply with the regulations, and we do recognise um, that all businesses and organisations do need essential clarity around some of these issues. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And very similarly, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it will provide an update on what progress it has made in preparing for the operation of the deposit return scheme. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. I refer the member to my previous answer. Brian Whittle. Thank you. Uh, the Parliament has a public cafe and shop which will sell produce subject to DRS legislation. How will the public return these items to the Parliament to redeem their deposit, especially as they cannot re-enter with empty glass bottles? Will it require a reverse vending machine outside Parliament, and how much will this cost? Clear Baker. Um, I thank the member for the question. We are considering the need for reverse vending machines, which would be leased or hired. It is likely these will be used initially for Parliament staff, and we are still considering how we comply with the regulations that would be under our responsibility as a producer in the public areas of the building. The costs at the moment are estimated, and once we have further information, we will share it with members. Question six, Martin Whitford. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what steps it will take to create a more family friendly the environment. Maggie Chapman. The Scottish Parliament was founded with the ambition to be modern, a modern family friendly parliament with a free creche provided uniquely in Europe to try and remove barriers for parents of young children engaging with democracy. And the creche will reopen in May. It, I can say more if, if, if you want me to say more about that later. And we also have the sitting pattern allowing for Fridays and Mondays to be focused in constituencies or regions. But it's clear that this has not always worked. Given its responsibilities for providing staffing and services to support parliamentary business, the SPCB recently wrote to the Parliamentary Bureau setting out some concerns about the impact of late decision times, whether planned or unplanned. We have asked the Bureau to consider, among other things, providing improved notice of anticipated decision times each day and of planned changes to decision times. We have also asked for its views on introducing a cut-off time for plenary business. We do hope to have a meeting with the Bureau in the near future to discuss these issues. Thank you. Can I remind members coming into the chamber to uh, respect the fact that there is ongoing um, SPCB questions and to uh, not engage in private chatter? And I call Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for that answer. The SPCB have a responsibility for the staff in this parliament. And um, in correspondence, it's become apparent that the SPCB are seeking to obtain further information about the challenges to the family-friendly setup that occurs within this parliament. Could I politely suggest that actually there is plenty of inf information already available? And actually, with regard to the staff employed here, um, within, the, within the, the, the Parliament decisions could be made by the SPCB, which wouldn't need um, input from Bureau. And would the SPCB consider um, reaching out to those members of staff to get solutions to this problem so that we can move forward to, as the member has rightly said, anticipation of a family-friendly Parliament? Maggie Chapman. I, I thank the member for that follow-up question. And yes, he is right. Corporate body does have responsibility for SPS staff. And for those who aren't aware, some SPS, SPS staff are required to remain at work for at least two hours after sitting periods have finished. So there is clearly a responsibility and a duty of care that we have. And this is why we want to have the discussions with Bureau. But your, your point is a good one, and we, we will take that up to ensure that we are getting the information we need, but also setting the parameters within which uh, discussions and debates can take place so we do live up to the expectations that we want to be a family-friendly parliament. Thank you, Ms Chapman. Can I repeat the plea um, that members coming into the chamber don't engage in private chatter while uh, SPCB questions are on? I'm calling a, a brief supplementary from Megan Gallagher. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Chamber might be aware, I have been raising this issue for quite some time. And since my return to Parliament in January, it has been challenging to balance here and home life. Talented MSPs have stood down because of the way parliamentary business is structured, and I know that is an issue for Government and Bureau. However, we do not want to deter people, especially women, from choosing to enter public life. So, Similar to Martin Whitfield's question, will the corporate body consider forming a group of MSPs, their staff and SPS staff to look at how we can make this parliament more family friendly? Maggie Chapman. I, I, th I thank the member for that question, and that is something we, we can certainly consider. I do think, though, that the first conversations that corporate body needs to have are with Bureau to make sure that we are all actually discussing the same thing and we are all aware of, of the constraints that are on the different types of staff we have. It is it's members, it is member staff, but they are different types of SPS staff as well. So we need to make sure we understand what it is we are trying to fix here. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now reached um, the point at which we need to move on to the next uh, item of business. With apologies to those I wasn't able to call, and there'll be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business. Point of order, Rachel Hamilton. Sorry, officer. I hope it's helpful, but um, the, there's something wrong with the microphones. I'm not able to hear. I couldn't hear Brian Whittle earlier, and I struggle to hear Megan Gallagher and yourself. I thank Rachel Hamilton for uh, that uh, point of order. I, I think there may be an issue with the microphones, which we're investigating, but I would encourage members to tilt the microphones towards them, um, which may help uh, in, in most instances. But we will be looking into it and trying to make improvements if that's uh, possible. Uh, as I say, there will be a pause before we move to the next uh, item of business.